Patients were staggering. Despite his initial excitement, he was unable to examine the fish in person for nearly two months, leaving Marjorie Courtney Latimer to deal with this strange creature alone. He probably thought I was making a mistake. Well, I'd sketched it, and I'd written all these letters to him about it. But he probably thought, you know, I was young and, and inexperienced with ichthyology. It's a funny thing to just suddenly decide about <laughs> bring a fossil fish out into the open. Marjorie was left with no choice. In order to save the fish for scientific study, she had it skinned and mounted. But without any preservatives, the internal organs had to be discarded. This was later described by Smith as one of the most terrible tragedies in science. So there were a lot of confusions in the beginning, and I got blamed for uh, losing the innards of the fish. I had to bear that all my life, but still. Well, the main thing was we saved the thing for the, we saved the skin and the top specimen. On the 16th of February, at 10 o'clock, Professor Smith walked into my office. I've been waiting for him since the 22nd of December. That first sight hit me like a white hot blast, Smith later wrote. It made me feel shaky and queer. My body tingled. I stood as if stricken to stone. And he walked round the table. And he said, this, this fish will be on the lips of every scientist in the world. It's a coelacanth. Since J.L.B. Smith identified the strange fish, he was able to christen it. He named the genus Latimeria, after the woman who had saved the fish for science, and the species Calumni, after the river near where it was caught. The press went wild with the news, calling it the most important scientific discovery of the century. A creature from a group thought to be extinct for millions of years was alive. It was a living fossil, a window into the past. The term living fossil had been coined by Darwin. In his writings on evolution, he argued that somewhere, most likely in the ocean depths, some creatures would have eluded the pressures to evolve and changed little from prehistoric times. Now, here was a living coelacanth, strikingly similar to fossils more than 50 million years old. basement of the museum now and the um, fossil fish collection is through here. Let's open the door. John Maisie is a paleontologist at the American Museum of Natural History in New York. Collections arranged in a systematic sequence or in an evolutionary sequence. And the coelacanth fossils we keep in these cabinets. Um, for example, here are some small coelacanths uh, from well, from, from right around here. These probably lived in fresh water. These are about um, a shade over 200 million years old. Now, these didn't get much bigger than this. These coelacanths lived at a time when uh, North America was still attached to Africa. So uh, New York could have been very close to Morocco at this time. Coelacanths first appeared, along with the other major groups of fishes we know today, about 400 million years ago. Then, the Earth was more or less one large landmass. Over time, this supercontinent separated into what is now essentially the modern globe, leaving coelacanth fossils on every continent except Antarctica. These fossils had been known to science since the 1830s. They'd been found in widely varying sizes, but with several distinguishing features. An oddly hinged joint in the head. Fins that 
that had a limb-like structure and hollow fin rays supporting the distinctive tail. The oddly spelled name comes from the Greek, meaning hollow spine. J.L.B. Smith wrote that finding a living coelacanth was like walking down the street and running into a dinosaur. Scientists were skeptical that the fish in East London was a true living fossil. Even Smith worried that perhaps the coelacanth had lain somewhere in the ocean bed, in some preserving ooze or mud these millions of years. But Marjorie soon assured him that the fish had snapped at its captors before dying. The press played up the idea of a missing link, an idea also derived from Darwin's theory of evolution. Darwin proposed that life came out of the sea, evolving from fishes to amphibians to mammals to us over millions of years. Was the coelacanth a missing link? That interim step from water to land. Was this fish the key to understanding our own evolution? All life came from the sea. And when we realize that life is really just an evolution of forms, these are the closest relatives to our ancestors. And then we, intellectually, would like to know who was the closest, who was the missing link. John McCusker is an evolutionary biologist at the California Academy of Sciences. We're dying to know what was that step from the fishes to the amphibians. And when they discovered coelacanth fossils, they said, aha, it must be this, this thing that walked out of the water. And when they discovered the living fossil, they said, that's it, our ancestor. It's alive. But Marjorie's fish was all they had, and it was only skin and bones. The innards had been lost. And we were, by such unfortunate circumstances, prevented from being able to find out what most of its body and organs were like. Were the coelacanth's internal organs like those of other fishes, or more like those of amphibians, reptiles, and mammals? It therefore became more than normally desirable, really imperative to find more. This would become J.L.B. Smith's life's work to find another coelacanth, and this time, an intact specimen. J.L.B. Smith was a hard man. He was a very, very focused man, and uh, yeah, that tended to turn people off who didn't share his point of view. But if you... Mike Bruton works today as an ecologist here in South Africa. He studied under J.L.B. Smith. Well, J.L.B. was a remarkable fisherman and uh, actually predicted that the first coelacanth didn't naturally live off East London, that it was a, a more tropical, deep water animal. Smith felt certain that if coelacanths were native to the highly fished waters off East London, they would have been caught many times before. He reasoned that Marjorie's fish inhabited the deep tropical reefs to the north and had been driven toward East London by currents running down through the Mozambique Channel. So he distributed leaflets all over the East African coast. Smith's leaflets, in English, French, and Portuguese, offered a hundred pound reward, an enormous sum for a local fisherman. But he still faced tremendous odds against finding a second specimen. After all, the coelacanth had proved amazingly adept at eluding discovery. was a fisherman, a mad fisherman. As with the first specimen, caught by trawler fishermen, Smith was counting on those who made a living from the sea. It's very fresh. And like Smith, biologist John McCusker knows where to ask when looking for a particular fish. These men are the best ichthyologists, I'm sure. They know the differences between, the subtle differences between different species, different populations. You want to find rare fish.
nice. You don't go to an ichthyologist or a museum. You go to a fish market. And these guys know fish. I mean, it's their whole life is fish. The fishermen of the Comoros Islands would prove to be a godsend for J.L.B. Smith. The Comoros are a small group of volcanic islands then controlled by the French, just north of Madagascar. Here, men have fished in the same way for over a thousand years and were said occasionally to pull out of the water a fish they called Gombesa. Comoran fishermen had no idea this fish might...